welcome to the show. I'm really excited because I, th I think there's a little bit of a shortage of places where people can tune in and always hear about raising capital. So that's why I started the show. And I'm super excited to have you on, Zach, because you're one of the, the hardest working young professionals I've ever met in my life. So congratulations on that. I want to talk about all kinds of topics, but we'll just kind of keep it casual and see where the conversation goes, see what, what different topics we can talk about. So why don't we start with uh, talking a little bit about your background and, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, no, thanks, Ruben. Thanks for having me on the show, man. I really appreciate the opportunity. I'm very grateful for it, and I, I like what you're doing here. I'm starting a podcast to talk about capital raising and multifamily. So, but yeah, so quick background on me. So I was born and raised here in Phoenix, Arizona. So I lived here pretty much my entire life. Um, I grew up in like a middle class, lower middle class family. So we were always everything that, everything that we needed, but never any real estate background or, or wealth background, anything like that. Um, the only time I didn't live in Phoenix, I, I played football at a small school in Colorado, realized I wasn't going to make the NFL. So I came back and I, I wanted to be a sports reporter and a, and a journalist. So I got a degree in journalism and mass communication from the uh, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism here at Arizona State. So I was actually, I was a live news anchor and sports reporter on Arizona PBS um, for a short time. And I, I co-hosted a show. Oh, there you go. Got your ASU shirt on. There you go. Oh, yeah. Um, I co-hosted a show on Fox Sports Network Arizona. So that, that was pretty cool at first being on TV and, and giving me a kind of an idea of what the journalism industry is like. But I quickly realized after talking to other people in the industry and a lot, seeing a lot of my classmates go and get jobs in, in different markets that you were crazy hours, you don't make a lot of money, and it's very political. And so I, I quickly realized, like, I don't want to do this. So I was like, crap, I had just gotten this degree. Um, I've got all this school debt. I was 21 and I had this fancy degree and I realized I don't want to do this. And so um, I was like, man, what can I do? So at the time, prior to that, I was delivering medical equipment nights and weekends to pay for school. My boss was like, hey, man, you can make good money doing healthcare marketing. And so I had just graduated and I actually got a job as a hospice marketer. So I don't know if you're familiar with the hospice care is by chance, okay. Ruben. Yeah. yeah. So, so basically, like it's basically most mobile nursing and caregiving for people with, with terminal illnesses and end of life care. So, so my job was to wake up in the morning and just drive all around Phoenix and just walk in cold to hospitals, doctors' offices, assisted living, and build relationships with physicians, social workers, nurses. And when they had a patient needed hospice, they would call me, and I'd be the first person to meet with that patient and family, and educate them on the resources, and if they if it's something they want to take advantage of, and we get them signed up. So. So it sounds kind of weird, but hospice, hospice care is actually an extremely competitive and lucrative private business industry. And Phoenix is the number one market in the entire country. I think just because there's a lot of seniors who live here, demographics. So basically it's federally regulated and reimbursed, but these are all private companies. So anyways, I was, I was very fortunate to do well in this industry. In all humility, I became like one of the, one of the top hospice marketers here. And so I was, I was quickly, I was promoted to the director of marketing and I became an owner in the company. And so coming from like a, a middle class type of family, all of a sudden, I was making more money than both my parents combined by the time I was 23. You know, I was making like 200K a year. Um, I got my MBA. I paid off all that school with cash. I bought a house. And so I was, I was very fortunate to be doing well. I did that for about four and a half years. I'm, t I'm 27 now. And I, I just quickly realized, like, I, sh I shouldn't say quickly realized because I was doing it for four and a half years, but I just got burnt out. I was working like 60 plus hours a week doing something I'm not passionate about. And I was on call seven days a week. And I was like, man, I do not want to do this anymore. Um, but I didn't, know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to do that. But I didn't have any time to figure it out. So last year, January 2018, I said, screw it. I'm done. I'm just going to figure it out. So I resigned. And I sold my equity in the company. And I had no plan at all. I had no idea what I was going to do. I said, okay. I'm going to live off of savings. I had relentlessly saved. You know what I mean? And, and Grace, I don't have any kids or anything yet. And so um, we didn't have a ton of expenses. So I said, I'm going to live off of savings for the next 12 months. I'm going to figure out how to create passive income so I can gain control back over my time. Because before, I had tried to pursue what I thought was my passion with sports journalism. I didn't like it. I pursued money and I made good money and I was fortunate. I don't regret it because it was a good uh, financial foundation but I still was not happy and there was no end in sight. I wasn't building wealth. So now I realize, okay, I want to build passive income because that gives me control of my time to pursue whatever I want to do and really find what my goals may be. 
And so I knew I wanted to do it through real estate somehow, but I didn't know anybody in real estate. Um, I had no background or anything like that. So I had met a guy a month prior, a family friend at a Christmas party, and he said, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay, and so the cliche, as the cliche story goes, I read that Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it kind of changed my mindset. And then I just started to consume as much real estate content as I could, reading all the books, the podcasts, just like yours, Ruben, listen to podcasts like this that provide value for people. And I was just learning as much as I could. So I was initially looking at mobile home parks, um, and I, I cold called over 90 mobile home park owners here in Phoenix trying to buy one. And I, I tried to buy one on a seller carry. It didn't work out. Another guy got it. Um, so I was like, crap, so I'm trying, kind of discouraged, and I just kept learning. I, I finally learned about multifamily, and I learned about syndication and the power of using Where did you, from? Where did you learn that? about multifamily from? I, I, so I was, I was originally, I didn't know anything about this. So I was originally looking at flipping houses, right? And then I was looking at mobile home parks. And you have to remember, like, I don't have any background with this. So the whole yeah. thing was very intimidating and overwhelming. And I just started listening to podcasts. I think I, I first started listening to, like, Michael Blanc's. Um, podcast about a family multifamily investing and I I read Ken McElroy's book the ABC's of real estate investing yeah, back there. there you go you got it. yeah that's a good book to have in your library and in and, and that book and that podcast really one of the first two catalysts for it because Ken McElroy kind of breaks down each step you know of how to do this and the more you hear people on podcasts and you read books you start to, you, your mind starts to shift and you start to think, well, maybe I could do this, you know, because I had a, I have a network made up largely of physicians, healthcare business owners who also hate their lives, but they can't get out of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because they got families or whatever. And so they would like to invest passively in something like this. And so multifamily for me just made, made sense. And because I had kind of just burned my shit, so to speak, like, like I had, I had like cashed out and I wasn't going to go back into that healthcare industry. I wanted to go big. You know what I mean? I was like, if I'm going to do something, I should go big. And so it was just like a whole evolution. It wasn't like overnight where, where I decided I want to do these big apartment buildings. And so with that said, I got to the point where I had read all the books, listened to some podcasts. I understood the fundamentals of how these things work, but that doesn't really get you anywhere. You know what I mean? As everybody says, you have to take action. And so I started, I started cold calling brokers, lenders, property managers, insurance people. Um, I, I, Cold call other investors, um, ba the Bakerson guys who you're affiliated with, who you you partner with. I cold called them and met with with Bruce and Ben, and so um, that was a big step for me because I was a sales guy. So you'd think that I would be confident, but I was terrified to meet with these brokers. You know what I mean? I had a lot of anxiety because it's intimidating, and you feel like you don't you don't belong in this industry, um, and it's it's completely foreign. So so anyways, I started to I started to build this network of, of professionals and my my team, so to speak in the market. Um, but even then six, seven months go by Ruben and I hadn't done a deal. I couldn't find the deal out of pencil. I couldn't find the right partners. I mean, you have to have combined net worth and liquidity, uh, equal to the loan amount to take these deals down. And I didn't, I don't have high net worth, high liquidity. You know what I mean? And so, so I started going to conferences, um, and I joined a mentorship group in Dallas. And at that point I already knew everything about multifamily. So I didn't need any education so to speak but i needed to meet other like-minded people um and so that's where i that's where i was able to take the next step because i i met a guy named robert robert Shefchik, and he also lived here in phoenix and he is high net worth high liquidity and so we decided to partner up and and long story short i went through a lot of adversity um burning through savings but finally in october okay so it's been 10 months now we find a deal that actually pencils, it's a 36 unit deal in Phoenix, and we put in an offer, it gets accepted, we're terrified, like what do we do next? And we, we peel it all together, we come up with the money, and long story short, we close on that deal early February, and then we've just been, we've just been um, fortunate to keep rolling, we've just been pounding the pavement, underwriting deals, looking for stuff. Um, the, the next month in March, we, we found a deal, we got a deal under, under contract, um, it was a portfolio of two deals, a 76 unit deal in Phoenix and a 59 unit deal in Scottsdale. And so we syndicated one of them. We did a tenant in common, a tick structure on the other one. And we just closed on that last week. So that was a 13 and a half million dollar portfolio of two deals. And, and we kept rolling. And today we're closing actually, the deed should be reported in like an hour or two. We're closing on a 137 unit, 17 and a half million dollar deal in Phoenix. So, so we've been very blessed and fortunate that I went through a lot of the adversity on the front end, but after we got the first deal, you kind of learn a lot 
and you, you, go, you grow thicker skin, so to speak, and we caught the momentum of being able to get the credibility and respect from the brokers to start winning some more deals. So, so now we've got, we've got 300, after today we'll have 307 units um, under management and $35 million of assets under management all here in Phoenix. So we've been fortunate to kind of go through that, that journey. So that's kind of the background of how we got into real estate to this point. That's amazing, man. You know, I kind of took a similar path. I was in the MBA program at the WP Carey School of Business and accumulating debt. And I thought that that school, or I should say getting an MBA would help you become an entrepreneur. But in reality, I found out that everybody that was getting their MBA was essentially signing up for an 80 hour a week corporate America job to manage somebody else's business. And I was like, there's no way I halfway through. So I can relate with the debt still. I still have a lot of school debt, but yeah, in, in regards to where you're at, I see that you're creating a strong, like branding of an authority image in this industry. You're doing it through meetup. You're doing it through Instagram. You're doing it through posts. You're always presenting yourself in a suit and tie or a shirt and tie. And you're creating this image for yourself where people, they see you as a hustler. And I think that's, that's so powerful. And I think that people have something to learn from that. Cause a lot of investors that I've met, they just kind of wear their t-shirt and, and they have success, but they don't feel like they have to dress sharp, but that gives you a, a huge advantage. Do you want to mention anything about like where you're going or, or what it is that you're trying to do to create a big presence so that people can find you because through the meetup, through your entrepreneurial subgroup at the Arizona Real Estate Investor Association and through all your social media, I think people see you as this really sharp hustler. Is that part of your strategy or is that just automatic for you? No, thanks. I appreciate the kind of words, man. And in regards to the tie, so I mean, like that kind of goes back to when I was doing the hospice marketing, I, I, I'm young, you know what I mean? Like, so I've always been younger. And so for me, the tie is all about perceived credibility. You know what I mean? Because it's very easy to dismiss younger people. And so um, for me, like you said, I think it's very important. I always wear a tie to any any broker meeting or broker tour or any type of to uh, any type of like real estate professional type of event. I try to wear a tie and a long sleeve shirt just to, just to present the uh, professionalism. And I think that's very important because because there's a lot of listeners here on your podcast, Ruben, who are in the same boat as me. You know what I mean? Just last year, where you don't have a background in this, and it's going to be intimidating and scary going to tour properties with these brokers and even meeting with them at their office because. I mean, everybody's intimidated. You don't need to be intimidated, but you need to kind of fake it till you make it. You know what I mean? You need to have like a perceived credibility. You need to understand to speak the lingo and you don't have to have a deal to do that. You know what I mean? So you just, you just need to make them feel like you're not wasting their time. Um, and you need to almost command respect. And so, so that's, that's the whole tie thing. And I think it's very important to do that. And then in regards to, in regards to the social media, so it's kind of like a, like a double-edged sword here, okay? So I wanna explain that. So this may sound kind of hypocritical. You guys are gonna think I'm a hypocrite, but I think psychologically that social media for the most part is garbage. I think that it creates attention-seeking behavior, fear of missing out. I think it's very distracting. And I think we have to be careful with multifamily and social media in this day and age because like now, now we're, in the, we're in the age of all these gurus, and there's so many podcasts, and not to say that it's not good, because I think podcasts are tremendous and, they, and they're, very, they're very valuable, but I think if you're trying to focus on being an investor, you cannot get too distracted with all the social media, because it can be very discouraging, you know what I mean? I remember last year I was looking on social media, and I see these other people I know getting deals, and it makes you feel like you're not doing an adequate job, or you feel discouraged, and you can't get caught up in trying to compete with other people. You have to compete with yourself. You know what I mean? You have to stay disciplined and know that everybody's on a different path. And, and, you, and maybe you don't have the money to quit and live off of savings. Like, I, like what I did was kind of radical and crazy. You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't have kids and Grace and I are not married yet. We're engaged. So I was able, I was in a fortunate position to do that. But I don't want people to think that you have to do crazy stuff like that. Like you can have a full-time job and you can do this. And, and for the social media, it's, it's very important, like you said. So on the flip side of that, it's, it's a necessary evil, in my opinion. It's extremely important and it's extremely powerful to get the exposure. And you wanna make sure you're coming from an authentic perspective and you're not just putting 
crap out there to look like an expert because I'm, I'm not an expert. You know what I mean? We have not gone full cycle on a deal. I just closed my first deal in February and we've been fortunate to close other deals because we are working hard and, and, um, and grinding away. But now the real work begins. You know what I mean? It's like we have to execute on our business plan because we have a tremendous responsibility. We have all this investor money and we're a steward of that money. So we have to effectively manage these assets and now the real work begins to make the money. And so I think it's important in this day and age to kind of to kind of vet and question what sponsors or syndicators have done and what people have actually achieved, how long they've been in it. But to your point, Ruben, you're exactly right. Social media is a, is a very powerful tool and it's important to get exposure and to have that, that credibility, the perceived credibility. You know what I mean? A lot of people talk about the thought leadership platforms and things like that. And yeah. so, like I said, I actually hate social media, so I can't take any credit for it. It's all my fiance, Grace. So I love Grace so much. She's like a powerhouse for marketing, and she's very skilled with it, and she enjoys it. I mean, full disclosure, I have a Facebook account that I haven't even logged into since February because I hate Facebook. You know what I mean? Like, like Grace logs into my Facebook, and she runs it. You know what I mean? So she's like the director of marketing. She runs our company, Facebook. She runs our company, LinkedIn. I do get on my own LinkedIn. I, I do like LinkedIn. I think it has more content. It's more valuable. But it's, it's just like, it gets too distracting. You know what I mean? You have to time block your stuff, especially the last six weeks. We've just been busy with acquisitions. I can't spend a lot of time. So like, for example, Grace will just, she'll text me screenshots of people who message me in comments and I'll text her my answers back. It sounds ridiculous, but it's like going back and forth. That way I don't get onto social media. You know what I mean? So, that she's, so, that, so I am communicating with these people authentically, and I'm all about helping people in, in abundance, providing value to people. But you just can't get too distracted. And so my advice is, is that if, you, if you're not good with social media, and then you need to try to, if you don't have a grace, if you don't have a partner or a spouse who's good at that, you need to try to hire it out because it is important. You need to hire a virtual assistant or somebody like you, Ruben. I know that you're, you're like a social media expert and you're, you were, you were hired and you're a partner at your company to do marketing. So you need to hire somebody like that, but yeah. you don't have to be that person. I, mean, I, for me, I would I actually to... say that I'm not an expert, although I try to brand myself as one, but really I, I outsource all of that. There's a company out of Florida that I use called I come up marketing for my Instagram and I'm starting from scratch. I used to, I don't know if you knew this, but I used to have a Facebook with 5,000 people on there. And then I ended up shutting it down. But back in the day, I used to try and sell real estate education. And I used Meetup as an avenue to get people to learn about me. And I never claimed to be an expert at anything. I just wanted to get real estate investors together so that I could learn from them and then maybe provide some content. I'm doing something similar to what you're currently doing, but you're crushing it at a different level. I had a group called the Phoenix Real Estate Investors. And on Meetup, I grew it to 2,700 people. But after I left real estate, because I broke up with my multifamily partner and then ended up back in corporate America and hated corporate America. So I took off to Mexico, was still paying for my Meetup, came back to the uh, United States, didn't realize that it was going to be so challenging with the market shift after the crash to get back into purchasing multifamily. And I had mindset issues. Um, trying to purchase things on my own instead of teaming with other people, which is how I created any success to begin with was always from partnering with people that had a track record. But um, my meetup, I ended up, I couldn't utilize it. And um, people were, were starting new meetups because everything was starting to heat up in 14 and 15. And mine was just sitting there. And I was just like, I didn't want anyone to change the brand that I had created the Phoenix real estate investors, which I still have that platform on YouTube where, where we still have our old multifamily videos and on uh, Facebook. So I just shut it down. But now, now that I've been reading Joe Fairless's book that talks about like creating an authority image, I realize that, man, I wish I still had that. And now it's just like to start from scratch. Um, I really like what you said about don't try to compete with other people because sometimes it's intimidating. I'm just like, how am I going to do a meetup again? That's as big as Zach's. I just like I freak out about it. But you're, yeah, you, you can't you're think successful. that way. You have to do your, your thing. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so I've decided to take the avenue, and, and I feel incredibly blessed that the Bakersons brought me on and took a big chance on me. So, like, I feel a level of pressure to go out and, and hire people to help me do what they want for their business, which is brand exposure. And I'm doing that through LinkedIn primarily 
and I'm hiring some people through um, through uh, through Instagram to help me with that. And then Facebook, I'm not really not concerned with because it can be a tool to uh, attract people, but I find that most people on Facebook are just not there for that reason. Um, although it is a good place where investors, I think, can go and, and connect with other people. Like I, I connected with somebody on Facebook through the Multifamily Investor Nation community that was posting and interacting um, and now he's going to be on my show. His name is Chris Salermo. He's going to be on the show next week, I think on Tuesday, but, uh, yes. I'm really excited for that. Um, but tell me about your experience with Meetup because I had a lot of success with it and now I'm not trying to use it as much, but I think that it's working super good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Grace and I, we went through a lot of adversity, just trying to figure this out last year. I, Basically, I lost last year. I lost all my confidence, my sense of identity. Like, what the hell am I even doing? You know what I mean? Because it's like you wake up in the morning, you're trying to figure out how to move the needle. And so we felt very fortunate when we were able to actually do a deal and then do the next deal. And so the whole meetup, the reason we wanted to start a meetup was just to provide value and abundance for other people who were trying to get into it. Because we would go on meetup.com, and I showed up to a few different Phoenix multifamily meetups. And the host it wasn't even there. You know what I mean? Like they don't even show up. So it's just like we, we saw that there was a, a lack of organization and valuable content. And so um, that was something we really wanted to do. So we started doing that in April. We've had like, what, four or five of them now. And we didn't even know if like two people would show up or what. But um, basically the format is I, I line up speakers who I think can provide value, whether that's brokers, investors, lenders, attorneys, um, all types of different real estate professionals. And, and basically we have like a speaking panel. So I'll create all these questions and we've got microphones and we're in the front, in the front of the room or on the stage and ask, just have an open conversation. Anybody in the crowd can raise their hand as we're going. It's, it's very organic and casual just to try to get the real story. Like I've had a broker on and I ask him, what are you guys looking for? What do you think if somebody retrades you? What type of terms are people putting up? Like what type of hard money day one? to take to win deals, like all the things that we think are secretive or industry, it's just not disclosed. I want to, I want to expose a lot of that stuff so people can feel like it provides value. So, so we've just been doing that honestly, just to provide value to help people out. And, and grace is a marketing machine. So she does all the online marketing. She gets digital flyers. The first couple of them, we're forking out like three to 500 bucks out of our own pocket to secure the venue, pay for food, um, like getting posters and marketing stuff. And so now we have sponsors, um, like, like people we've worked with, like my lender, our, our, our attorney, our property management company, title companies, things like that, who have seen the value, you know what I mean? And so that's, that's all grace. I can't take any credit for any of the meetup. I literally just, I land the speakers and I write the questions and I host it um, and speak. That's it. She, she does all the, the event planning, the marketing. But yeah, I think that it's been very valuable just because like you said, it's all about creating that perceived credibility. You know what I mean? And, and the thing is, like in any industry, not just multifamily, but any entrepreneur, you have to start somewhere, right? You're not going to just be an expert. And so you have to break in somehow. And so just, just like you're doing with this podcast, Ruben, I'm not doing the meetup, doing primarily the speaking. I'm simply a facilitator to have successful, experienced real estate professionals on there. And I ask questions that I think other people want to know. And just like you're having, you have people on here, which provides value for other people. And in turn, you provide, you, you create like an image where you're credible or you can associate with these people. And so, so that was the, the Phoenix multi-family meetup that we started out. And it's been going very well. We've had no fewer than 40 people. We've had 50 to 60 people at a lot of them. We had easily over 50 people a couple nights ago. And we had some great speakers. And then, and then we started another meetup called 35 Below, like you mentioned, through the Arizona Real Estate Investors Association. And I know you, you showed up to that, Ruben, so thank you. And basically... I was talking to the president of Azria, our local real estate investor association. Al Langston, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Al Langston. He was saying how there's there's a void for younger professionals and financial education, and, and so I had kind of proposed starting a class that we talk about financial education in a real estate context. So we've been doing that the last two months, and it's really cool um, where we're targeting people 35 and younger to come to that, and we just talk about different topics like. We talked about, like we had one a few nights ago about house hacking. So I had two speakers who are both in their 20s who have successfully house hacked. Like one, one guy, he's like 27, he's house hacked two fourplexes. You know what I mean? By getting 
just getting a VA loan or an FHA loan living in one of the units. And so these are strategies that people don't know about. And that's kind of my passion. So if you're going to do a meetup, um, don't think about the exposure or the credibility. That will, those are all residual effects. You need to really think about the abundance mindset and the value that you can bring to people. You know what I mean? Because there are people who show up. Like we've had serious players show up to our meetups. You know what I mean? We had Ben Leibovich, um, who's big on bigger pockets. He showed up to one of our meetups, and that's how I got to know him. And now him and I have become friends, and we're, we, we're text often, and it's all because of the meetup. So, so it's kind of cool. You don't know who will show up to the meetup, especially if you market it effectively on social media and who you can befriend, whether it's future partners, future investors, or just simply people that you can have a, a positive influence on and help them out and kind of pay it forward because people will remember that. You know what I mean? And so it'll always come back around to you. You have to remember when you're going through the adversity, you, you hope somebody would do that for you. So that's kind of the cool thing is trying to connecting a community of multifamily. Yeah, I would say that for people in other, in other markets, uh, wherever you are, if there's a, a lack of multifamily or, or even if you're just getting into real estate or want to learn about real estate, um, a meetup, uh, even creating it just to attract other people, the network is a phenomenal tool. I met my, uh, my old partner. Um, he showed up uh, from San Diego bankrupt right after the crash because he lost everything on spec homes. But he understood what was happening in the market and that it would recover. And he started, he was so passionate about investing in multifamily properties that he started convincing people to give him the money to joint venture partner. And we started going from, from project to project. I just met him through one of my meetups. So um, what resulted from that meetup, and this is why I suggest that, that you do it for anybody that, that may be listening, and, and if they're considering doing a meetup, uh, this partner, I just started filming him at his projects on YouTube what he was doing, how he found it, um, what he was going to do to reposition, how he's going to tenant occupy, and how he was going to do it so fast and effectively. And by doing that, he raised 650 grand to purchase additional multifamily properties. And that was all as a result of just being, like you said, of abundance mindset and trying to provide value through the meetup to the people. So I definitely understand that, and I definitely recommend it. Because I have a couple of things I wanted to ask you. For example. I'm not sure if you've read Thinking We're Rich or if you're of the mindset of like auto, yeah, auto suggestion, uh, mindset, yeah. having a so, positive belief. Yeah, I do. I'd love to hear your, your perspective on that and how it affects you as a multifamily investor or just a, a person in general. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, that, that's actually so I read Thinking We're Rich last year when I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. And it was actually a very, very influential book. I've read it several times. And when I, when I say I read books, Ruben, I actually can't sit down and read a book. Like I, I'm too anxious. I can never just sit down and read a book. So I do audible. Like I, I do audio books I do and I always do while I'm working out in the morning. So I, that's the only time I can like, I can, I mean, I, I mean, no excuses. I could do more, but that's just when I do it. Like I, I allocate that time working out and listen to audio books, but, but yeah, I'm a firm believer in a lot of the principles taught in uh, thinking grow rich where it just talks about where if you have faith and just relentless determination, then you will achieve it. You know what I mean? And so, and that kind of brings me to, uh, I was just talking to somebody about, I'm a big fan of a book called Miracle Morning, which talks about uh, basically like, like morning regimens and disciplines that you do. And so for those who haven't read it, it's just about a morning regimen. So for me, um, for example, what I do is I wake up, I've got a gallon of water next to my bed, I drink a bunch of water to be hydrated. I'll, I'll brush my teeth, wash my face, and I'll go upstairs into my, my home office. And for like 10, 15 minutes, I'll just, I'll just be in silence and I'll pray and I'll think. Because I'm, I'm a Christian, so I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. So my faith has taken me um, through a lot of adversity and gotten me through sometimes where I feel like I need to quit or I'm not doing the right thing. You know what I mean? So I think it's important to, to have the faith. And it doesn't matter what your religion is or what you believe in. The faith of believing that you can achieve what you're going to do. You know what I mean? Like you talked about, think you're rich. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just sit in that silent meditation, prayer, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll journal. So I'll write my thoughts out. You know what I mean? Like what I have to do that day. If there's anything bothering me, I'll write it out, um, what my goals are. And at the end, I'll always put my goals, like six, 12 month goals. And, I, and I'll write it as I have done this. So you've achieved it. Just like in Think and Grow Rich, like you mentioned, Ruben. I think that's very important. And then I work out every morning, you know, almost every single morning. And it's not for the physical benefit it's for the mental benefit it's for the it's for the release of endorphins and the dopamine you know what i mean and i always have a lot more energy throughout the day and i'm just in a better mood even if it's like a 10 minute 
quick cardio workout, whatever, um, if I do it at home, then it, it helps tremendously. And I can notice the difference when I don't do that. And so, yeah, I think you have to have the faith, you have to have the determination. And ultimately, this is a grind and it's, it's a long-term play. So your, your daily habits and your daily disciplines, in my opinion, will make or break you. Whether you're going to do multifamily or you want to do any type of business or any type of relationship, anything successful in life, it's your daily habits. It's about getting appropriate sleep, eating right, um, hydrating, what your mindset is like, like you said, Ruben. So all those things to me are very important and it allows you to continue to have endurance to keep doing stuff. And some people may, may think of you as like unstoppable energy. And it's just because you're daily, like each day you're refreshing your mind. You know what I mean? So it's very important. All right. So let's get to the nitty gritty. Cause I think people are tuning in to find out how to raise capital. Now the, the total worth of the projects that you are involved with, how much capital did you guys as a group have to raise in order to make that? And how did you do it? Sure. So the first deal was a 36 unit deal and Robert and I, we got under contract. We needed to, we needed to bring in 1.4 million. That was the, that was the down payment plus closing costs plus all of our, our CapEx or renovation money. And so we didn't know what the hell we were doing. We were each 25 K hard, like under contract, non-refundable. And so I put like all the money I had left. I put like 160K into the deal. I was doing whatever it took to get the first deal. And I had relentlessly saved this money and gotten a pop from selling my equity in the company. I put 160K into it. Robert puts almost 300K. And I'm just like pounding the phones. I met a person at, at a conference. Her name is Elisa Zhang. And we had several phone calls. I was talking to her about this deal. And she's like, hey, I got a 12 unit deal in Seattle. And it's closing two weeks prior to your 36 unit deal, why don't I sell it, 1031 exchange it into your deal and we can do a tenant in common structure. And I was like, okay, great. I don't even know what a tenant common structure, tenant in common structure is, but let's do it. So we did that. She brought almost half the equity with that. She brought like over 600K. And then we just pounded the phones. It was people I had met throughout the year. And you're, when you're raising money, you have to realize until you get a track record or experience, you're gonna probably have a high failure rate. You know what I mean? There's going to be a lot of people who's, who want to, want to talk to you for an hour about your business plan and everything, and, and they may not invest. And so I got three guys to put in 150. Robert got some people to put in money, and we did that. So that, that deal was not a syndication, okay? So to be clear, that was a tenant in common. And a tenant in common, legally, everybody is active. Yeah. There are no passive investors. So it's kind of like doing a small partnership. Like if you and I were to buy a deal, Ruben, and we just partner, you put in money, I put in money, you would be a tenant in common, I'd be a tenant in common. But you can have an LLC, which is considered your tick LLC, and I can have an LLC, which is oh, my tick LLC. Yeah, I want to talk about that because the way that we used to structure it is we would just all purchase the LLC together. And that's that's essentially instead of doing a tenant in common with the house, because that's a form of taking or the property, that's a form of taking ownership on title, you can all own the LLC together and accomplish the same thing. So that's yeah, you, yeah, you can do yeah, you you can do like a traditional partnership where you're all in the same LLC or do a JV. The, the benefit yeah. of a tenant in common structure is that you can take advantage of 1031 exchanges. So you can 1031 into a tick and 1031 and tick is an acronym tenant in common for those mm -hmm. of you who aren't aware. You can 1031 exchange into it. You can 1031 exchange out of it. So for example, we at least a 1031 exchange for her 12 unit deal into this deal. I created an LLC, which I'm the manager of, and I have members in the LLC who invest money. Robert created an LLC, who's he the manager of. He's the manager of that, he has members. So we have three LLCs, okay? Total, we have 1.4 million of equity among the three LLCs. Well, we're actually on pace right now to double our money in 12 months. It's been going really well, we've been very fortunate. So what we're planning is to, is to sell the deal in the first quarter of 2020, okay? So if we can take our 1.4 and turn it into 2.8 of equity, we can all three 1031 exchange together and buy a bigger deal. So we're basically, we're deferring our capital gains into a larger deal, which will leverage it to create more passive income. Or if we, if we decide, Hey, Elisa, Hey Robert, it's been great. I don't want to partner with you guys again. Sorry. All three tenant and common LLCs when we sell can separately 1031 exchange into three separate properties. Okay, so with my LLC, we have 440K of equity. If we double it and we, it's 880K, with a loan, we can go buy a three to $4 million asset. We could 1031 exchange of that. We can go buy our own deal, a smaller deal. 
So it gives you flexibility attending common to 1031 in and 1031 out and just leverage, leverage your capital gains into bigger assets. So that's the cool thing about a tenant in common, but you have to be careful because legally in a tenant in common, everybody is active, okay? So there are no passive investors. So you need to keep everybody who's in your LLC, if they're members, they need to be updated, they need to be on calls, they need to be sent up regular updates because if they ever get upset and they say, hey, Ruben's the manager of my LLC and it's not going so well and he hasn't been telling me anything, they can legally argue and sue you for a security because a security yeah. is when you, you, you're passive. Like you, you take somebody's money and they're not involved. That's why with the syndication, what we do is we do what's called a 506B or a 506C. Right? Regulation D, 506B, Regulation D, 506C, which are exemptions to the SEC so you don't have to actually file a security. Okay, so filing a security to the SEC is a pain in the butt. It's a lot of paperwork. It's very expensive. So Almost everybody who's raising money for these multifamily deals is getting these exemptions. And so, so we've actually done, we've done both a 506B syndication. We've also done a 506C. The differences are with the 506B, it means that you can take up to 35 non-accredited investors as long as they are sophisticated. So for those of you, for those of you who don't understand, um, for those of the Rubens listeners, accredited means that if you're single, then you've made $200,000 or more each of the last two years, and you reasonably expect to make that much this year. Or if you're married, it's $300,000. Or you have a net worth of $1 million or more, not including your primary residence. So that is what an accredited investor is. With a 506B, you can take up to 35 non-accredited investors. However, you must have a pre-existing substantive relationship with these investors prior to the deal and they have to be what what the sec considers the sophisticated and so it can sometimes be somewhat ambiguous what sophisticated is but it, it means that they need to understand real estate they need to have some type of real estate experience even if it's like a single family rental they need to understand how this works and a lot of this was put into place because of bernie madoff you know what i mean screwing people over taking people's money doing pyramid schemes so this is to protect investors so that that's a 506b where you have to have a pre-existing relationship, you cannot solicit or market your deal in the general public. Otherwise, you are committing an illegal act with the SEC and they'll yeah. come after you, okay? So you have to be very careful. And if they were to ever come after you, you have to, it's up to you as the sponsor to document and prove that you have substantial relationships with each one of those investors. So there's a lot of liability there, you know what I mean? And, and it's, and it's, there's no, there's no real case law on it, so it can be somewhat ambiguous, but you need to be careful and have a substantial relationship. You, you cannot market it. So that's a 506B syndication. A 506C is when you can market the deal and there's no limits to your marketing or soliciting. However, you can only take accredited investors who meet that income and or net worth threshold, right? And you have to take reasonable steps to confirm that they are accredited, okay? So, so last week we just closed on a 506B, which is where you had a pre-existing relationship. That was a 76 unit deal here in Phoenix. Today we're closing on a 506C, which is a 137 unit deal. And so the 506C has been a lot different and there's pros and cons to it. You know, I, mean, I think most people are doing the B and I think more people are starting to do the C. And so on the C, Basically, what are reasonable steps to confirm they're accredited? So you need to have third parties. So there's, there's for our SEC attorney, um, we use Mauricio Raul, and we highly recommend him. He's been great with Premier Law Group. He uh, basically he gave us three options. Okay, so you can have the investor CPA can fill out a template that our SEC attorney has created, and the template there's two templates. They only need to fill out one. One is for the net worth requirement. The other one is for the income requirement. The CPA has to fill that out and sign off on it saying, yes, my client, the investor, is indeed accredited. Okay, so we have to have that. Yeah. That's one option. The second option is the investor can send you copies of the last two years of their W-2 um, statements, tax statements to show, and they need to send you an email or a statement saying, I reasonably expect to make this much of this year. Okay, so that way you've confirmed via income. The third option is there's a, there's a company called verifyinvestor.com mm -hmm. where the investor can go on there and fill out a series of questions and upload documents. And that's a third party. And so that, that, that basically, that satisfies 
the reasonable steps through via a third party to confirm that they are accredited. And that's, that's $60 a pot. So we as the sponsors, we absorb the costs and we underwrote that into the deal. So we said, okay, we, we gave the investors these three options. Um, they have a package, like if you buy 25 subscriptions that you can get like a reduced rate, which we did. And so we basically told investors, these are your three options. If you want to be a verify investor, here's the link, go we'll fill it out and we pay for it. So, so that's a 506C. So the 506C is a lot different because you were talking about social media presence and marketing, Ruben. And the cool thing about the 506C is there, there are no limits to what you can do. So yeah. it was actually pretty fun because the 506B is stressful, man. It's like you have to be secretive about it and you need to be really compliant. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, have I had a, a substantial enough relationship with this investor to take them in? You know what I mean? You need to be, be sure that you're compliant with that. Whereas a 506C, you just need to confirm they're accredited and you can literally post on Facebook look, I'm Ruben, I have this 100 unit deal, do you want to invest? And that's what we did. So we did targeted, we paid for targeted Facebook ads, targeted LinkedIn ads, we did a bunch of videos, posted on social media. On one of our monthly meetups for, uh, for July, we actually used our meetup, it was kind of like a dual opportunity for us. We did a case study of the deal that we had in our contract, so that it's providing value and going over the whole business plan, kind of look inside the hood of this deal for the people who showed up, but it also served as a marketing opportunity for us. And we streamed the whole thing on Facebook Live. And so basically anybody could see on Facebook Live this whole business plan and case study of our deal. And so we're providing value so people can understand the fundamentals of the, uh, of the Phoenix market and how we underwrite these deals, the assumptions that we use. But if they're interested and they're accredited and they can verify it, then we can also take them in as investors. So yeah. it was kind of cool. We did another event in Dallas. We were, we were going to be in Dallas for a conference. And so the Friday night before that, this was all Grace, by the way. She like, took two days notice. I was like, hey, we should do this event. Let's, like, let's do an event and, and, and talk about the deal, case study again. So she calls like a restaurant, secures a private room, creates an RSVP link, blasts it on social media. And we get like 50 people that we don't even know show up to this event. It was pretty crazy. And we've handed out like pamphlets of our, of our executive summary of our business plan. And we just did a case study on the deal, like 45 minutes talking about the deal, the business plan, the underwriting fundamentals. And we got investors from that as well. So the 506C gives you a lot of opportunities to leverage meetups, social media to find investors. Um, but to be honest with you, Ruben, a lot of people have asked me like, well, what's your conversion rate? The conversion rate for getting investors from social media on a 506C for us on this one deal particularly was not very high at all. Okay. No. It does give you good exposure and good branding, but we didn't get a ton of investors from it. The real value of a 506 C is that you can tap into other spheres of influence because if Ruben is sponsoring a deal and you have an accredited investor friend who wants to invest, well, guess what? Your accredited investor friend can tell his friends who are accredited and they can invest even if you don't know his friends. You know what I mean? So, that, so that's a big value because on a 506B, you have to have a pre-existing relationship with each one of the investors personally. But it allows you to get referrals from friends from friends who can invest in your deal. And that happened with us. I had a, I had a repeat investor from the 506B deal that we had previously done. And he was going to invest in this deal again. He's like, hey, I got a buddy who wants to invest. Um, do you mind if he invests? I said, not at all. Let's get on a call though. I want to make sure like, he understands. So we had an hour long call. And the guy invests 200K, you know what I mean? And I had never met him before, but he's accredited and it's completely legal and compliant with the 506C. And so, and I also, I know some physicians and I had a physician who invested in a 506B. He says, hey, I got a buddy who wants to invest. Is that okay? I said, sure. So we talked to him and sure enough, they want to invest. So it's, it's cool because friends of your investors may trust their friend. If their friend's investing, they, they want to try it out you can tap into other spheres, okay? So that, that's the advantage of the 506C, Ruben. The disadvantage is that you cannot take unaccredited, also known as sophisticated investors. So we had to turn away a lot of investors and repeat investors from our last deal who wanted to get into the deal because they're not accredited, you know what I mean? So, so that's kind of the, the double-edged sword. So you need to look at what's your investor base made up of, what, what spheres are you tapping into, for some people, it may not be an issue if you have mostly accredited investors, but if you have sophisticated investors, you may not want to do a 506C because it may be more challenging to raise the money. Yeah, I know we wanted to talk about the, 50, the 506B and C structure. Currently, Bakerson has a 506C, and I'm allowed to say whatever I want on social media about it. 
But I did wanted to, to say, because we started talking about all these legalities and legal aspects, is that myself and Zach, we're not lawyers, we're not tax accountants, and we recommend speaking to counsel about that and or an investment advisor. Yeah. But I led, you, I, led on a I, led, I led you on a tangent and uh, it, it led to some awesome content. I, cause I think for me, I don't know that everybody's fascinated and interested in um, the, the legalities about capital raising, but it's, imp it's an important subject and something that I'm personally fascinated about. On, I have a show coming up about a guy that's actually doing crowdfunding um, to raise money. So we're going to talk about the, the legalities about that. But going back to where, where um, we had originally talked about how you raised capital for your first deal, and then we went into structures for your next two deals. But I kind of want to talk a little bit more if we can focus exactly on how you raise the money using those two different systems for your, um, uh, your projects and why you selected one. Because you did a 506B and a 506C, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So you, on the second deal that you did after you did the tenant in common structure, then you, you went and you started, you found a deal and then you started raising money for it. But first there was a process to go to a lawyer and get, get everything set up. Um, or did you find the property first and then get the lawyer to write all the documents for it? And then once those documents were ready, how did you raise the money for it? Yeah, good question. Good question, Ruben. And sorry, I uh, talk so much. I no, no, it's cool, over. man. I love it. It's good content. Huh. Good footage. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, so that, that's actually a great question because I didn't know that answer that either. I'm like, do I need to set up an LLC beforehand and then go buy a deal? So here's the process is that you don't need to do any of this legal structure until you find a deal. Don't start talking to investors about a deal unless you, unless you know them well. You can maybe say, hey, we may have an opportunity coming up, but this needs to be a relationship, if you're doing a 506B, that you've had and you trust that they're sophisticated and it's a strong relationship. The process is you find the deal and once you're going to put in an offer, like in your letter of intent, for example, you can say um, buyer is um, Ruben Greth or, and or assignee, okay? And, and usually you, you want to have that the assignee is an LLC that you control. So for every deal that we do, we do not create an LLC or necessarily engage an attorney before we go into it. I mean, we'll, we'll basically, we'll draft a simple LOI with the terms that we need. And it, and it may be beneficial. Like you said, I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, so always consult your attorney, always consult your CPA. I'm merely repeating the information that our SEC attorney and our commercial transaction attorney um, tells us. So, but for the LOI, it may be good to talk to a transaction attorney and just say, hey, what, what item should I put in this letter of intent? Because a letter of intent is just a non, it's, a, it's, it's not a legally binding document. It's basically just a, a letter that you're saying, this is our interest in the deal. These are the, this is the amount we'll offer. Um, these are the things that we request. For example, after we go under contract, we want your rent roll, your trailing 12 financials. We want all your, your contracts, um, all the information, your insurance, loss runs, things like that. So it is good to engage an attorney just for that LOI, um, but it's not legally binding. When you get an accepted LOI, at that point you've been awarded the deal, you'll then go into the process where you're negotiating your purchase and sale agreement, your PSA, also known as a purchase contract. Then you wanna have a transaction, a, a commercial transactional attorney draft your PSA, okay? And the seller may have like a template um, draft contract that they have for you that reflects the terms that you put in your LOI with purchase price, et cetera, et cetera. But you always want to engage your attorney before you sign any contract, okay? So you want to have your attorney review all these things and, and go through that process. And, and you want to, at that point, when you've been awarded the deal, you want to engage an SEC attorney as well, just to get ready. Because you want to talk to your SEC attorney. And, and we've worked with a couple different ones on a couple different deals. And um, they've both been great. But basically, they need to know what your business plan is because they're gonna create what's called a private placement memorandum, also known as a PPM. A PPM is a, a lengthy document that will go to every single investor and it, it basically discloses every potential risk and every disclosure within the deal, okay? And so you're gonna create a business plan for this apartment investment opportunity. And we, we use the same business plan that we use on our webinar presentation, okay? So we create webinars for all these deals, like a PowerPoint slide, 
that discusses the, the deal, the market, the fundamentals, the business plan, et cetera. We, you can use that same business plan and we'll go into your PPM. Give that to your, your SEC attorney. They're gonna create this PPM, which every single investor has to read, acknowledge, and sign off that they acknowledge everything in it. Okay, so that's your PPM. The second document that's important for SEC attorney is what's called your subscription documents. Okay, so the subscription documents are what each individual is gonna individually fill out and it's, it's basically, it's individualized for that one investor. Okay, so they're gonna put in their specific information, first and last name, background, what, are they accredited or not, um, address, how much are they gonna invest, things like that. Okay, so everybody has to fill a subscription document and there's, there's usually four different forms. There's one if you're gonna invest with cash as an individual in your own name, there's one if you're gonna invest with cash as a, with your spouse. There's one if you're using a self-directed IRA or solo 401k, there's a separate subscription doc. Um, if you're gonna invest through an entity, there's a subscription doc for that. So, so yeah, you need to engage your transaction attorney, your SEC attorney, um, after you've been awarded the deal, really, Ruben. And, and you'll create an LLC that you'll purchase that deal in, okay? So basically, your investors are not buying the property itself. Your investors are buying shares or units of an LLC that then owns the property. And this LLC that owns the property, known as the operating LLC, is a manager managed LLC, which is managed by a second LLC. And, and the sponsors or the general partners, the syndicators, they are gonna be in that manager LLC, whereas your past investors are gonna be in the operating LLC. So that's, that's kind of the, the basic overview structure and, and the involvement of the attorneys. Yeah, that's phenomenal content for people that are thinking about multifamily syndication. It seems like right now, multifamily syndication is like what wholesaling was a few years back or maybe even uh, 10 years back because it was so popular. It seems like there's so many gurus and so many people that are trying to go big or maybe even back before then. I don't know if, if you remember, I guess you were pretty young, but like 10 years ago, uh, right after the crash, there was this thing called bulk REOs where people would sell like these big packages of houses that had like a thousand properties in them. And then they would sell them for like a billion dollars or something like that. Now, I was actually trying to, to, to do it, like calling people, like cold calling people and trying to be like, all right, you know, are, are you the seller? And he'd be like, no, but I, I'm not a daisy chain. And there's all this back and forth. And you're essentially wasting time talking to people that had no real connection to the the thing because it was like buying a lottery ticket if you just closed one of these bulk transactions you just got like close to a million dollars in commissions and whatnot but today wow. the multifamily syndication is is uh, uh something that a lot of people are trying to learn because they see value not only in multifamily but in working it with a team um, so that they can invest because trying to do it on your own you just can't go as far you can go maybe a little faster but you're not gonna go as far and you're not gonna go as big. So the, the, the team environment I think is very um, appealing to the people trying to get in, but they just don't know where to get started. But one of the things that you can do is tune into people like Zach and listen to the, the content because the more that you know about the multifamily syndication, if that's your area of interest, the, the more prepared you're gonna be when you finally go and start talking to brokers and other people. But okay, so going back to your 506B, your second property, what was the total capital raise on that? Yeah, so the, the, the second property was a $3.7 million total raise, and that was that was the down payment plus the renovation costs. And and you bring up a good point, Ruben. I want, I want to tie in kind of your last two points with that is that when you get started, it's hard to raise money. Like you can listen to all these podcasts and people say, oh, there's all this money sitting on the sidelines. All you gotta do is find a deal and the money will just flood in and it's super easy. It's not true at all, okay? I know a bunch of people with money, but until, until they understand multifamily and they trust you as knowing what you're doing, they're not gonna give you their money, you know what I mean? And so when you're getting started out, don't feel a bunch of pressure to raise money on your own. Like you said, Ruben, you need to find partners who have a track record, who, who have a track record in raising money and they have a established, uh, investor database. I mean, you can try and, and you may be able to raise money, you know what I mean? But you may not be able to raise all of it. And so you have to, you have, need to add people who can help to raise money and who have experience with asset management and have experience with investor relations. So it's very, there's a lot that goes into it. And, and nobody that I know is doing it all on their own. Okay. When they say it's a team sport, it sounds like a cliche, but it's, it's true. It's a cliche because it's true. 
Like there's, there's, there's a skill set of finding the deal, working with the, the uh, broker, the property manager, finessing all the relationships to make it all come together. There's somebody who needs to raise capital, and, and ideally you should all be raising capital, but you can have some heavy hitter capital raisers and who are gonna be involved with the investor relations and with the asset management. And you need to have people who are really, really strong with underwriting and who love the numbers and can crank a lot of underwriting. So you need to find these complementary skill sets. So you don't have to raise all the money on your own. You need to find other partners. I, don't, I didn't raise any of that money on my own. You know what I mean? I wasn't even the top money raiser in any of these deals. I partnered with other people who are, who are valuable um, and experienced. And the value that I bring is being the local boots on the ground, leveraging the relationships I have with the brokers, finding the deals, and just working hard in, in the sweat. You know what I mean? And, and maybe in the future, I will work with somebody else who's less experienced and I have a track record and I can raise a lot of money and they'll find the deal. You know what I mean? And so, I will promise you that you're going to do that because you're still yeah. an abundance mindset and you want to give back to the community. That's a very powerful part of you. I, I want to get to that point where once I become an experienced multifamily syndicator, I'm not going to feel satisfied until I have like two or three people that I've taught how to multifamily syndicate as well because – this right. is what's happening with Bakerson right now. They're teaching me all the aspects of it. I'm focused on one part of it, but eventually they want me to grow into other aspects of, of it. So I definitely can relate with what you're saying. Because I, I, as much as, as I want to do it for like my family and for creating legacy, part of you know one of my missions in, in my declaration statement is is to help other people succeed. You know that's part of the phrase that I use in the in the morning when I read my my declaration statement. So That's awesome. I'm with you there, but um, the total capital raised 3.4 million. You said that you didn't raise any of it. It was all through your project. No, I, no, I, I, I raised 965K of it. So, so yeah, I was, I was not the primary person. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I, I, was, I was fortunate to, to, uh, to get some people to invest. I, so I raised 965K of it. Um, and, and we had, I mean, everybody was raising money. We had five five different general partners. And so we were all, we're all contributing to, uh, to make that happen. And then the next project, you guys chose a 506 C. Was it the same group as the, as the second project? As far as the uh, partners? Yeah. Some, some of them were, some of them were different. Um, so, so, so yeah, the, there were a couple people who were the same, the same people like our, our core team. And um, one lady, we, we, she's a valued partner. She had just had a baby. And so she was kind of, she was out of it um, for that one. We brought in a couple other guys who are more experienced, who have, who have more vast investor databases. Because our second deal, or I should say the second syndication, it's our fourth deal, was the 506C. It was a $17.5 million deal as far as the purchase price. And it was a $6 million raise. So that's the combination of the down payment plus the renovation money. Um, we had like a little, we had a $13.1 million loan on that deal. And, and that's why we brought in these experienced guys to help raise capital and help with asset management. And we were talking about legalities. And just to be clear, Ruben, you cannot bring in co-sponsors or general partners purely just to raise money. It's illegal yeah. to bring in people just as capital raisers. They need to have an active role with asset management, investor relations, things like that. And so when I say we bring in people with, that are heavy hitter capital raisers, they, do, they are. They have experience, but they also have experience with asset management. And they're heavily involved with the asset management role. So they'll be on all the property management phone calls and they'll do, be doing investor relations with their investors, updating them, things like that. So, yeah. so that is Actually, important. To I know. want to bring something up about that because that's my specific, what I'm focused on is raising the capital. And there's so many ways that I can get in trouble doing that. So right. one of the things that you can go around it, that's very typical, is that you become a limited partner or a small share partner in the company. But based off of the amount of capital that you raised, if you're getting paid or, or actually you can't even do that, but let's say that, that somebody wants to bring in $500,000 or a million dollars or whatever the amount of cash is on a deal and then become a partner, if they, if they raise more or less, your equity share in the company can't change because that is like getting paid in terms of equity right. of the property. Yeah, you, 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 you can right. go to jail for that. So like we're being yeah, it's incredibly like careful. About, you know what I mean? So we're being incredibly careful about how we get structured. And it's not even official exactly how I'm going to get paid through Bakerson. But one of my duties is to raise capital. And once they give me a, a specific portion of the company, assuming that's what we end up doing, 
then that number can't change on this deal. Now, I can get paid in bonuses for like the work that I do in social media and other things, but I can't and you can't as capital raiser, or anybody out there listening can't get paid based off of the amount of capital that you raised unless you're an investment, uh, what, are, what are they called? The investments, uh, the broker, a securities investment broker, something to that extent. And you have to get licensed for that, which I don't have. Yeah, so something like that. I don't have enough knowledge to speak on it. Honestly, that's why we defer to our SEC attorneys. But yeah, what you're saying is, is correct is that you can't say like, okay, Ruben, for every 500K you raise, you're going to get 1% of this general partnership equity. It's illegal. So yeah, you have to have a flat predetermined rate of general partner equity going into the deal. And then that's going to include whatever you do. So regardless of how much money you raise, that's going to include that plus your asset management responsibilities, investor relations, things like that. So that's, so, so when you're trying to build a team, you want to try to feel people out and say, Hey, what do you think you conservatively raise based on your track record and your database? Cause you, you want to put together a team that you feel like you can raise the money, obviously, otherwise you can lose your shirt and all your earnest money and destroy your reputation. It's scary stuff. Like these are big raises. So you want to put together a team of people who feel like they can confidently raise 500 K or a million or whatever, but you can't say, okay, we're going to give you two points to raise a million. But if you don't raise that much, we're going to cut you down. Or if you raise more, we're going to give you more. You can't do that. It needs to be a predetermined set rate. And that includes all of their responsibilities from capital raising, regardless of how much they raise plus asset management and investor relations. So the, this is my understanding. And this is, this is all what we learned from our SEC attorney. And so this, these are the, the rules that we follow. But again, neither of us are SEC attorneys, so consult your attorney to learn more about this stuff. Yeah, man. Okay, so why did you choose? I know that you had a couple of different partners on the, on the deals, but with one of them, you chose the 506B, and one of them, you chose the 506C. Was that correct? Did I get that right? Yeah, on the syndication. Both. So what do you think, without getting into the legalities of things, the benefits are, I guess you already talked about that to, to some extent. With one, you can go after accredited investors, uh, and the other one, you can you can basically go after previous relationships, but you have to keep it kind of in the dark and only talk to them about it. But why did you, what was the decision process for, for selecting one versus the other on your two deals? Yeah, I mean, on the B, we did it because that's just kind of what everybody was doing, honestly. Like, we didn't really think twice just to do a B or it is a B. We had we established pre-existing relationships, and we felt like as a collective group that we had the investor databases, respectively, to, uh, to execute on that raise amount. On the C, we actually didn't plan on doing a C, and it wasn't anybody's one decision. We were just kind of talking about our our investor networks and we realized the six million dollar raise was a was a significantly larger raise than we had done previously and so i was actually talking to a couple of our partners and i said like hey how much how what percentage of your previous deals were accredited investors like what percentage of your investors in your last syndications were accredited and a couple of them were looking it up and like well mine's 85 percent mine's 90 percent and we noticed on our b that we had just done 85%. So we're like, okay, well, the majority of our investors are accredited anyways. And so can we leverage social media meetups? And more, most importantly, can we leverage other spheres of influence of friends of our investors to gain, gain more investors? And we just kind of, it was nobody's one decision. We were just kind of talking through it. We talked to our SEC attorney and we said, what's the, is there any additional cost to doing a 506C as opposed to a 506B? And he said, no, there's no cost difference at all. So what are the rules? And basically what we talked about, he told us the rules. So it seemed like it was kind of like an experiment for us because none of us had ever done it, but we actually raised the funds a lot more quickly. And so, and, and I'm not here to say to anybody out there that a C or a B are better because you need to analyze and do an evaluation of what you think your investor networks are made up of. Um, so you gotta be careful. You don't wanna jump into a 506C if you feel like you have a ton of sophisticated investors who are not accredited because you can't take those people. You know what I mean? And so, so I think it's just, you have to really evaluate the investor databases and kind of think of who your investors are going to be. So, I mean, we, the, the, the one thing I will say liability wise is that a C is much safer than a B because with the 506 C you have, in my opinion, and I'm not an attorney, you have, you have a lot less liability than a 506B because if the SEC ever comes knocking on your door for a 506B, you have to show documentation that you have the substantial relationship and they want to see a paper trail of your communication. With the 506C, 
You don't need to do that. You just need to show that you took the reasonable steps to verify they're accredited, which has to be done prior to closing. So basically with a 506C, you do have that additional hurdle, which some people are concerned about. And when I say people, I say sponsors. They say, oh, well, I don't want to do a 506C because I do have a bunch of accredited investors, but it's a pain in the butt to get them verified. They're accredited. They don't want to give them that problem. For us, it wasn't a big deal, honestly. We gave them the three options. And there are people who like kind of slack off, like they invested their money three, four weeks ago and why and filled up their docs. Um, and basically they hadn't been verified. And so the rules are for our SEC attorney is that until you close and you countersign those docs, they, don't, they need to be verified prior to you closing and countersign all the subscription docs. If, if somebody invests their money and, and you haven't closed yet and they haven't been verified, if you find out they lied, then you send the money back. You know what I mean? Because in these deals, when they're filling out subscription documents, they're basically saying, this is the amount I want to invest. None of those, none of those documents are final or, or actually legitimate until they're countersigned by the sponsor. So it has to be a mutually executed document. And so that's why you, you do want to make sure that you're verifying all these people. Like, for example, in the last week, we had a few people who hadn't been verified. And we'll call them and say, hey, either verify you're accredited now or we're taking you out. We're sending your money back. You know what I mean? And, and so that was, all, that was all guidance from SEC attorney. And that's how you stay compliant. So those are some of the different challenges and hurdles. Um, we liked the 506C. We think that allowed us to get different spheres of influence. And it's from a liability perspective, I think it's, in my opinion, it's safer. But again, I'm not an attorney. I don't want to give anybody any thoughts or impressions and they say, Zach told me to do this. You know what I mean? Consult your SEC attorney. This is simply our experience with this one particular deal. And maybe I'll have a different experience with a different deal. You know what I mean? So that's, that's what we've seen. Yeah, man. Zach, this has been great so far. Like I could sit here and talk for another long while, but we're getting into like over an hour. So I think we're going to sign off. Maybe you would like to join us so we can talk about some of the other things. Cause I want to talk about, like what working with your wife is like um, and how that affects the, the relationship and what you guys, like I'd really like to talk about your goals and what your plans are and what it is that you want to accomplish with multifamily and talk more about why it's such an amazing vehicle uh, over other asset classes like stocks and bonds and anything else that people may invest in. And then maybe even some IRA stuff and raising money because we don't even know exactly if you got it all cash or some of it in IRAs or whatnot. But I could, I could sit here and talk forever, and I really appreciate your time. What I'm going to do um, is I want to give you a chance to tell people how to contact you, um, and then we can kind of sign off from there. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm happy to help anybody however I can. I'm happy to jump on a call and provide any value. Or if you, if you have questions about how to get started, motivation, how to talk to brokers, I'm happy to help you. So just shoot me a text and we can set up a call. So my cell phone number is 602-859-5458. Once again, it's 602-859-5458. Just text me and we can set up a call or shoot me an email. My email is Zach, Z-A-C-H at Z-H multifamily.com with no hyphen. So just reach out to me and I'm happy to help. Or you can go to our, any of our, you can go to our website, Z-H multifamily.com. Um, any of our social media um, sites, Z-H multifamily, connect with me. We're happy to help however we can. Yeah, and if you want to watch this show again, go to CapitalRaiserShow.com or just reach out to me on social media at Capital Razor uh, on Instagram or Ruben Greth on Facebook or any of you'll you'll be able to find me. We're not we're not hard to find. We don't we don't hide. We try to make ourselves as public as possible. So I'm gonna say sayonara to the to everybody out there. Thank you so much for tuning in. And to Zach Hapenstall, man, you've been awesome. I'm so I'm proud to be associated to people like you because you're up and coming and, and you're just, I can see, I can see it like every time that I'm around you, how hard you work and how hard you're going to, you know, continue to work to, to go after your dreams and to accomplish all kinds of really amazing things. And you're going to help a lot of people along the way. So man, congrats for, for being you, that. I, I appreciate for having that. Thanks for the kind of Thank you, man. Appreciate you having me on here.